Today from the Global Lane, rockets rain down on Israel. Will a U.S. plan for peace stop this? A new acting attorney general. Is Trump using him to end the Russia investigation? Allegations of voter fraud in Florida, again. What should be done? Victory for a conservative speech on a California campus. And football and turkey. Or thanking God for our blessings this Thanksgiving. And it's all right here, right now, from the Global Lane. Imagine rockets raining down on your neighborhood, forcing you and your loved ones to take cover. Well, on Monday, November 12th, Hamas terrorists launched 400 rockets from Gaza into southern Israel. Israel's Iron Dome anti-missile system knocked out about a quarter of them. But one Israeli man was killed, others were injured. A ceasefire was accepted. But is this the start of a new escalation of violence between Israel and the Palestinians? Might a new Middle East peace plan to be unveiled soon by President Trump make a difference? Well, joining us here in studio is David Parsons. He's vice president of the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem. David, so why this escalation now? Why now? Well, we've had uh, periodic es escalations, but the sort of prevailing atmosphere has been sort of quiet as far as rockets. They've preferred since March to have these demonstrations. They get violent. Uh, and they've been launching these fire kites and fire balloons, first with incendiary devices and later with grenades and other explosives. But once in a while, they'll start uh, um, firing rockets. It's Hamas' way of saying, Israel, you crossed a red line, or, we, you know, we're still here reminding Israel has to uh, respond. They just can't let Hamas, uh, without impunity, uh, uh, with impunity, to just fire rockets all the time. And the, the situation, uh, you know, is tense, but uh, I don't think either, either side really wants to go into a major escalation right now. It was interesting this happened right after Benjamin Netanyahu gave $15 million in humanitarian aid uh, to Hamas. He, uh, he approved uh, funds going in. Look, Gaza is a humanitarian disaster in the making. They hardly have uh, any electricity during the day. Israel f supplies the fuel for their power plant. They're hooked on to the Israeli power grid as well, as well as Egypt. But there's these rolling blockouts all the time. And the fuel, they, they want someone to pay for it. Qatar wants to pay for it. But it's actually uh, Mahmoud Abbas and, and the Palestinian authority up in Ramallah, which lost control of Gaza to, to Hamas, that is trying to uh, uh, scuttle that deal of the fuel going in so that the people of uh, Gaza are suffering, want to blame Hamas for it and, and ask for Fatah and the Palestinian Authority back. I, I think that's interesting because most Americans don't realize that there's division right within the Palestinian leadership. Well, you, uh, we talk about a two-state solution, but right now the Palestinian camp is divided where, you know, Hamas is in control of, of Gaza and, and the Palestinian Authority, uh, semi-control of the West Bank, Israel is there. And so you've already got Israel and, and two Palestinian states already, uh, effectively, de facto. Now, President Trump soon, we don't know exactly when, but will unveil his peace plan. One that he says will change everything in the Middle East. He's bringing in the Qataris. He's bringing in the Saudis, of course, Egyptians, Jordanians, so forth. Um, any idea what might be in that plan? Look, we've been building up to this peace plan for uh, two years now. We haven't seen it. What we've seen, it's quite unusual for, you know, uh, so much marketing of a peace plan that, that really hasn't leaked yet. And I believe what's been happening is... The uh, uh, President Trump's peace team has been going to the region and throwing out trial balloons with with the Saudis, with Egypt, with Jordan, and and other players that will you know uh, reconcile with Israel as a way of trying to get uh, show the Palestinians, look, these other Arab countries, because of the Iranian threat, they're willing to make peace with Israel. You better get on the uh, same page. You better get back to the peace table. But uh, none of these trial balloons have really uh, brought anything yet, and I think it's just been uh, trying to market something to keep uh, the overall strategy in play, which has to do with uh, containing Iran. So looking for the Palestinians to give something, but I can't recall them ever giving anything up. <laughs> yes. Well, it seems to be the other side. Uh, so quickly, a lot to pray about then. Yes.
Look, I, I think uh, if you ask how can Christians be praying, the, there is a truth when you say, look at Gaza. Half the population of Gaza is under 18 years old, Gary. It's, it's one of the youngest populations in the entire world. And Hamas is there with rockets and terror tunnels in, in what's basically a big open air kindergarten and school that, that if half the people around you are young people, that's not the place to put all your military hardware and invite rockets, but that's what they're doing. And what needs to happen is the Palestinians need to start caring about their own children and their future above their motivation to destroy Israel. And I think Christians, we really need to start praying into this and to start uh, demanding it of world leaders that it is total, absolute child abuse, the, the uh, indoctrination of these children from the womb to hate Israel, and that's the biggest goal, and dying as a martyr a shaheed in, in killing Israelis. That's the most valor you could have in life. This has to change, and we have to pray for the Palestinian people themselves to start having a heart for their own selves and their own children and their future. And then maybe, as Golda Meir says, when they, when they uh, love their children more than they hate us, then we'll have peace. So changing hearts and minds in the Middle East. Amen. Big task. A lot yes. to pray for. Yes. Okay. Thank you, David Parsons, for joining us Thank today. You, God bless you. God bless you. Parents, the Superbook Bible app is a great way to get your child reading the Bible because in today's busy world, we can use some help. The free Superbook Bible app has fun stuff your kids will love. They'll have a blast learning the Bible, playing great games, watching cool videos discovering heroes in the Bible. They'll have fun while they learn God's Word. The Superbook Kids Bible app, available now. Life, it's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it, I came to give you life. Life to the fullest. Life in your family. Life in your finances. Life in your body, mind, and spirit. Life in your every day. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life. Live it fully. CBN.com. We had four jobs that didn't go right, but, you know, we didn't waver in our faith. That's when God put on my heart that we needed to do the well. Within a couple of days, we got an insurance refund check that we had no idea was coming. And here we are, you know, this year, it's just boom. <laughs> you go out and help other people and you get rewarded for it. Get Pat Robertson's latest teaching, Miraculous Blessings. Some Democrats and the state of Maryland say President Trump acted illegally when he appointed Matthew Whitaker as acting attorney general. Whitaker was named AG after Jeff Sessions resigned at the request of the president. Maryland wants Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, named Acting Attorney General. And some Democrats on Capitol Hill say, at the very least, Whitaker should recuse himself from overseeing Robert Mueller's Russia investigation because of past comments he made about that investigation. Well, here to sort all of this out is former federal prosecutor Sidney Powell. Ms. Powell is author of the legal thriller License to Lie, Exposing Corruption in the Department of Justice. So, Sidney, it's so good to see you again. Did or did not President Trump follow the law when he appointed Matt Whitaker to be acting attorney general? He did follow the law when he did that. I'm sure he had the very excellent advice of White House counsel. And he also reached out to the Office of Legal Counsel of the Department of Justice before they made that appointment. And the Office of Legal Counsel issued a more formal decision advising that they found it constitutional for him to do that. So why didn't he appoint Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein? 
Well, Mr. Rosenstein has more conflicts than Carter has little liver pills. I mean, Mr. Rosenstein has been conflicted from the day he wrote the memo suggesting that Comey be fired from the day he named Mueller to run the investigation himself, having worked for Mr. Mueller from his first job in the Department of Justice. I mean, I've been amazed that Mr. Rosenstein could preside over that investigation from the, its initial beginnings. So I am delighted to see that Mr. Rosenstein is no longer supervising that, as I never understood how he could do it in the first place. Well, maybe he'll be next out. Um, he should be. Well, some Democrats are demanding that Whitaker recuse himself from overseeing the Russia investigation. Should he? Why or why not? I think that's absolutely hilarious. He apparently made some comment when he was a private citizen uh, about the investigation. And no, that is absolutely no basis for him to recuse himself from it. No, he should not recuse from anything. The Democrats are going to have an absolute hissy fit no matter who the president appoints to do anything. We should just get used to it, expect it, you know, belly up to the bar and deal with it because that's what we're going to be dealing with for the next two years, if not the next six years or eight years or the rest of the existence of the United States of America, frankly. Now, I know some Trump supporters are hopeful that Whitaker will proceed with an investigation of the investigators. Former officials like James Comey, Andrew McCabe, Loretta Lynch, maybe even Hillary Clinton. What do you think Whitaker will do? I certainly hope he will get to the bottom of the cover-up that enabled all of this to begin with. The Clinton email investigation was an absolute sham, and the cover-up that enabled that to occur was a criminal cover-up, and the email misconduct that she engaged in was a crime. I've got an article from three or four years ago now called The Countless Crimes of Hillary Clinton, published on the New York Observer. You can find them all on my website at sydneypowell.com. Even from the information in the public domain, it was obvious that she had committed crimes in violation of the Espionage Act. There are just multiple facets to this that need to be investigated. The American people are entitled to know the truth about all of this wherever the chips fall. Well, tell me, what do you, what do you think? What have you heard? Uh, is the Russia investigation wrapping up, or is it likely to extend into the new year? Well, I mean, rumors are flying that Mr. Mueller is coming down with more indictments. Um, I, I don't think they're going to reveal anything with respect to the Trump campaign's collusion with the Russians. And I hate that word collusion because it's not a crime. It's another one of their weaponized words to try to make things seem bad that aren't. Okay, Sidney Powell, former federal prosecutor, author, legal analyst, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Here come the lawyers. Attorneys representing Democrats and Republicans descended on Florida in hopes of getting a favorable election outcome for their clients. A statewide recount was ordered for both the gubernatorial and Senate races. But did voter fraud actually occur in Broward and Palm Beach counties? And no matter what the outcome, what steps must be taken to ensure ballot and election integrity in the future, not only in Florida, but elsewhere in the USA? Well, back with us is Eric Eggers. He's an investigative reporter with the Government Accountability Institute in Florida and author of the book Fraud, How the Left Plans to Steal the Next Election. So, Eric, a Florida judge said there was no evidence of voter fraud in Broward County. Do you agree? Why or why not? Well, I, I disagree for this reason. Uh, we know if we define voter fraud as ballots that were cast by people who shouldn't legally be allowed to cast ballots, then we know that's occurred. Um, see, what happens is the legal definition of voter fraud that oftentimes judges rely upon is underinclusive, and that means they include only the examples of non-voters impersonating legal voters. But we know in Broward County, thanks to the admission of election supervisor Brenda Snipes, that ballots that shouldn't have counted have been blended with ballots that will count. So we know that the true weight of honest votes will definitely be devalued. So I disagree with the judge because we know we have documented evidence of illegal votes that will be counted in Broward County in this election cycle. Eric, we know that last May a judge ruled that uh, Broward County election supervisor Snipes had violated state law and federal law when she destroyed ballots in the 2016 congressional race. So 
What else do you suspect has been done this time? Why is she still holding office? Well, that's a great question. There's a lot of layers to it. Uh, not only has she destroyed ballots illegally, but she's also admitted in the past to allowing illegal immigrants and felons to vote, just because, quite honestly, she would say, and this is true throughout the state, there's no real way to prevent people from registering to vote and, and voting illegally. The safeguards just aren't in place. So she's admitted that that's happened in Broward County. She's also been accused of opening ballots outside the presence of the proper authorities that known as the canvassing board, other officials who are supposed to oversee that process. And when she was sued and questioned about it, her response was that she claimed that she didn't actually know what the meaning of the word canvassing was. So these are all things that have happened historically. Uh, so the question would be, is if her track record as far as executing the responsibilities of her office are so checkered with errors and um, you know incompetence, then what assurances should we have that they've actually done a good job of preventing the legal of preventing illegal ballots from actually being cast? Because we know there's been an effort to cast illegal ballots in this election cycle. There have been 108 attempts to double vote in Miami-Dade County that thankfully the canvassing board down there found and was able to eliminate. Uh, we know that non-citizens have attempted to cast ballots in Palm Beach County. And you may have seen reports that lawyers for Andrew Gillum and Bill Nelson actually objected to the exclusion of those non-citizen votes. So we know that efforts by illegal voters to vote in this election have occurred. The question is just how many of them have already been counted in Broward County. Now, what other states, Eric, where did ballot counting or other irregularities uh, elsewhere set off your fraud alert alarm? Well, the reality is, is that there's opportunities for fraud anywhere there's administrative error in terms of the voter rolls. And as I've discussed, there are 248 counties in this country with more registered voters than citizens of legal voting age. So literally every corner of the country is susceptible to having illegal votes cast in the name of people that just shouldn't be on the voter rolls. California, for example, has a million illegal immigrants with driver's licenses. And they had admitted that they'd inappropriately registered at least 1,500 illegal immigrants to vote. And that would actually be a felony for those non-citizens. So uh, it's literally all over the country. And uh, the good news about what's happening in Florida is that because of the recount proceedings, we're going to have officials and lawyers taking a look at it. We're going to have lots of eyes on the field, so to speak, to make sure the rules as far as followed. Well, you can have all the laws on the books, but if they don't follow them, what good are they, right? So. What do we need to do to ensure uh, election integrity in the future? Well, it's a great point, Gary. And I'd also add on that sometimes even the laws that exist are incapable of preventing fraud from occurring. In Palm Beach County a few years ago, Palm Beach being one of the other counties we're currently waiting on, we had documented evidence of voter fraud. There were 22 affidavits signed by voters that said campaign officials came in and filled out their ballots on their behalf and submitted them which is a massive violation of the law, yet no charges were filed. So uh, we know that the laws that are in place sometimes aren't enforced, and even if they are in place, they're not enough to keep what I think most Americans would consider voter fraud from occurring. Okay, Eric Eggers, we thank you for joining us. Sorry we had to do it again. Hey, Gary, uh, me too, right. and uh, thanks for all you do. When you give, smiles grow bigger. When you care, homes are happier. When you comfort, the hurt goes away. When we all come together to love, miracles happen. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. My husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. 
Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Hello? Is this thing on? Hey, kids. Do you love games? And do you love discovering things? Yeah. Well, do you? Yeah. Then you're going to love this. It's the new free Superbook Kids Bible app. You can play games, watch videos, find answers to your questions, and a whole lot more. The new Superbook Kids Bible app. Free downloads available on iTunes and Google Play now. A college professor fired for discussing conservative views in his sociology class has been reinstated. An arbitrator found that Moreno Valley College of Riverside, California, made unfounded claims against Professor Eric Thompson. Here to discuss this case and to set us straight about free speech rights on college campuses is Brad Dacus. He's founder and president of Pacific Justice Institute. So, Brad, I understand Professor Thompson taught at Moreno Valley for 13 years, and PJI defended him in this case. Explain to us what happened, what led to his firing. Yeah, this was outrageous. Uh, you know, he had tenure. He'd already been awarded uh, awards in the past for uh, outstanding, uh, you know, for being a pro professor, doing a great work. Well, he was teaching sociology. And at the time he was teaching sociology, the case dealing with same-sex marriage was pending before the United States Supreme Court. So it was very uh, topical, very timely for him to address in the classroom. And he uh, addressed both sides, uh, heaven forbid. Uh, he provided uh, both uh, perspectives. Uh, encourage critical thinking, encourage class discussion and debate and on the topic. Well, because he did that, because he provided both sides, he was terminated. They said that this university's position was, oh, no, there's only one side, only one side that's allowed in this university, and that's the pro-gay marriage side. That's it. Even though it was pending before the United States Supreme Court, and even the Supreme Court was divided five to four, but this man was fired because of his objective, uh, critical thinking that he proposed and carried out as a professional professor should in the classroom. Now, he wasn't pushing his views or forcing the Bible on students or evangelizing. So what was the source of his teaching? Yeah, um, he brought in a number of, of resources uh, to provide alternative perspectives, uh, you know, a video uh, showing a different perspective. You know, one of the, the big debates was whether or not uh, same-sex attraction was something that people were just genetically pre-programmed for, or whether it was primarily the result of environmental factors, uh, several um, uh, different environmental factors. Uh, but nonetheless, he presented both sides, and because he presented both sides, um, he was fired. And uh, that is outrageous, because uh, professors are supposed to provide critical thinking in a public uh, university where it's supposed to have the, the market, open marketplace of ideas. How did Professor Thompson respond with grades on exams and papers? Yeah, he was very fair. Uh, there was no uh, allegation that he uh, was particularly harsh on one group of students or over another. Very fair. That's his track record uh, from day one. And he was uh, carrying through with that track record in this particular instance as well. So there was nothing as far as uh, harassment or belittling students or punishing them in terms of their assignments or their grades. What is the message then to administrators at other colleges and universities who may attempt to limit free speech in the classroom and on campus? Yeah, make no mistake. Uh, universities across the country, you need to learn that if you try to purge professors because of their ideology, uh, because it's not the far left perspective, or uh, punish students, uh, there are ramifications, and our organization, Pacific Justice Institute, will wholeheartedly defend these students. In fact, on our website, pji.org, uh, we have a number of resources, one of, with regards to uh, students' rights on campus uh, that they can grab onto. And also, we have a, our Legal Insider, a regular update on a more than two dozen pending cases right now that people can be uh, kept aware of. And of course, uh, pray for us as well, and pray for those cases as well, uh -oh. at uh, pji.org. Okay, Brad Dacus of Pacific Justice Institute, thanks for setting us straight today. God Almighty is a God of blessing. He always wants to bless His people. But how do you get that blessing? And what principles will unlock that secret? 
In Miraculous Blessings, Pat Robertson shows you how to open the floodgates of God's awesome blessings in your life. In order to have a blessing, you've got to be blessable. Discover what the Bible has to say about God's covenant of blessing, the laws of blessing, and what are the hindrances to the blessings of God. The words of Jesus, they are as valid as the law of gravity, and if we follow those laws, we will be blessed you'll see amazing true stories of everyday people whose lives were rescued and transformed by God's miraculous blessings. But even the doctors acknowledge that this had to be a miracle. Call 1-800-700-7000 or visit CBN.com to become a CBN partner and get miraculous blessings today. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. My husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. Well, it's just about that time of year again when retailers and advertisers take us right from Halloween to Christmas. Whoops, whatever happened to Thanksgiving? It's become a national holiday that now takes a backseat to other more profitable holidays. For many Americans, it's only about stuffing ourselves with turkey, watching football. I don't know about you, but I've always wondered why I feel sleepy after eating that big Thanksgiving meal. And guess what? It isn't because of the turkey. It's actually from all the carbs we eat with the turkey. Anyway, it seems that fewer Americans are aware of or even care about the real reason we celebrate Thanksgiving. Remember those elementary school pageants? Yes, it's about the pilgrims, giving thanks to God for the harvest and their blessings as they struggle to build a permanent European community in North America. Here's pilgrim reenactor Leo Martin. He heads a tour group in Plymouth, Massachusetts. What you're not learning is that we are a Christian nation founded on Christian principles. And we tell that story. We don't tell it only because I'm a Christian. We tell it because it's a fact. The pilgrims came to America for a religious freedom. So this Thanksgiving, let's thank God for the freedom we have to practice our faith as we choose in America and for the many other freedoms we enjoy in this country. And let's count our blessings and thank God for all he has given us collectively as a nation and in our own lives. Let's take time to pray and thank the giver of all good things, the one from whom all blessings flow. And from all of us here at the Global Lane, have a happy Thanksgiving and be blessed.